<clears throat> I'm going to put a picture up here on the screen and ask you to look and see if you can figure out what this invention is. And I don't know if you can tell. Can you tell what that thing does? And, and obviously, we moved the sermon. We're talking about communion. You can probably see that that is an automatic communion tray filler. Right? It's a, basically a big pot with 40 different little tubes, and they all go directly to the 40 holes in one of these trays in a simple pull of a lever. Um, if we wanted to spend $2,995, we could get one of those. We don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Maybe the people that are filling them up might say, hey, but, you know, for four, four trays, we have a thing that, that works pretty well. Wilford Greenlee invented this, 78-year-old man. He invented it. He patented it to help his home church. He does actually attend a Southeast Christian, which most of us are familiar with. The article that I found about the invention was actually in the Washington Post in 2001. A Lori Burling on April 8th had written it, and she said at the time of the writing, Southeast was averaging about 15,000 people in church, and they had seven volunteers who spent as many as 30 hours over the course of three days to prepare communion, just as you see it here in front of you. They would start every week on Thursday and get done by Saturday. Another picture from when I was growing up in First Christian Church in Springfield, and that's the front of the church, and I I think that was probably my ordination service, and... That was back in the day, and we had glass cups, and volunteers would sign up for an annual turn to pick them up. If you see the little holes in the pews in front of you, we would partake individually, put them in the, the pew racks there, and then that meant the kids and the family would run around the sanctuary with plastic buckets and collect 1,000 or 1,200 glass cups each week. And, yeah, we spilled a few drops on the pews, back, and, and somebody had to wash those. They had to hand wash 1,000 or plus and stack them all in the trays and then be ready for next week. And as we've come now to this second, we have these four sermons, the Church of Christ, these these distinctive doctrines, and we're considering this portion of of the service, communion. Um, It's also listed as Lord's Supper. Uh, We use both terms interchangeably by design, and obviously we've moved it uh, this morning for reasons that I've explained to talk about it later. And one, one of the ways, you see several blanks on the bulletin, but one of the ways in which the Church of Christ practice is distinct is, is in the frequency. How, how often do we have communion? And here in the Church of Christ, we have the Lord's Supper every week. Southeast Christian Church is still filling 350 plus trays every week. My home church now uses disposable ones just like we do. It's, the trays got heavy for some people and you know, just technology and all that kind of stuff, but they still have to use 1,000, 2,000 every week, you know, every Sunday. Whether it's at the end of the service or earlier, our guys are going to step up. We're going to share a meditation. We're going to remind you of the significance of this partaking, and we do that every week. You know? and, you're, and you may be aware there, there are different churches that, that do it on, on a different schedule, um, some churches have communion Sunday once a month. Um, others might have it about four times a year. Um, 1 Corinthians 11. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 11, it's page 958 in these black pew Bibles. It's one of the passages that talks about the Lord's Supper, and we'll kind of spend most of our time there this morning. 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm actually reading right now the paragraph that begins verse 23. Paul writing, for I receive, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the text there at the end, you see it says, whenever you do this. <clears throat> and some churches, sometimes you might have it on a Christmas Eve or a sunrise service, maybe a wedding. Uh, why, why do we have it every week? Because the people that partake less frequently sometimes ask us, say, well, doesn't that become too commonplace? Won't it lose its meaning if you only took it once a month or once a quarter? We think that makes it more memorable. And then I usually come back and say, I... I follow that logic, but where do, you, where do you draw the line? But by that conversation, wouldn't once a year, 
be even more memorable or maybe once a decade or if, if I just took it once in my lifetime, most memorable of all. You know, so, so that's one of the conversations that we have and, and frequencies are all over the board. So I keep coming back to why do, why do we have it every week? Because we feel like that matches up best with what the practice was in the early church. We talked last week about if you're trying to restore the church practice to, to the best that you can in the beginning, the original, it would appear every Sunday. That's what it looks like it reads. And there's a type, there's a foreshadow, there's an illustration even in the Old Testament. It's in Leviticus 24, 5, and God is telling Moses and the people of Israel, I want you to set up the temple uh, the tabernacle at the beginning, but the temple and the furnishings and this table with the bread on it, and this is what the text says, and part of it will be up there for you. Take fine flour and bake 12 loaves of bread using two-tenths of an ephah for each loaf. Set them in two rows, six in each row, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. This bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. And then Aaron and his sons would eat it. And I understand that that's Old Testament. I agree. Um, there are also New Testament appearances, scriptures that we look at. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves, the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Does, does that kind of sound like a church service? Yeah, it does. You know, there, there are four different aspects there. Uh, they're distinct, but they're all together. Uh, it's like one big chain. They did one. They did all four. And you know, the sermon, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, which is their term for the communion prayer. We do all those weekly. And if somebody's real quick before you say, so there's nothing about offering, right? I don't have to give a... <laughs> hold, hold, hold your horses there. You know, there, there are some other passages um, in chapter 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 1, now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Nobody disagrees that they met and collected regularly, first day of the week. And, and that's why the passage in, in 1 Corinthians 11 Paul's words to the Corinthian Christians about how they are celebrating communion, that, the, the same, that same weekly service. That's why these words are important. I'm going up now to verse 20. Again, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. 20. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. It's not the Lord's Supper that you're eating. You guys come together and you have communion and maybe they had you know, full meals even after that. But it, you're making a mockery of this. You're not treating it seriously like you should. And we'll talk about a little bit more of that later. But the idea of they did every week. Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. And, and that text is especially significant. If you look at the context and you look at verse 6, he says, But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later joined the other at Troas, where we stayed seven days. And it's that little phrase, where we stayed seven days. Why would you stay there that long? Paul's on the clock. We know he wants to get to Jerusalem. Why would you come in and then stay there for a whole week if break bread just meant have a potluck? You, know, you could have done that on Monday when you got there and left. But they thought it was significant. It was important to meet around the Lord's table with the people, and they waited for the first day of the week, seven days. You know, that, that's, that's the best restoration we can find of what appears to be the early church's practice. First day of the week, week after week after week. You know, I put just three blanks there on the next one where I put bread, juice, symbols. Uh, th those are the simplest terms for what we use as the elements, the emblems. In a few minutes, if you've been here before, you know we're going to pass these trays around, and there, there's a little cup of juice, which will represent Jesus' blood, which was poured out on the cross. And we have these little pieces of bread. They don't have yeast. Some of them have gluten. Some don't. But you take a little piece of bread to remind you of Jesus' broken body and what he endured on the cross. And as we read this, as we understand the Scripture the best practice is that the juice and the bread remain just that. They remain juice and bread. They are symbols. They are representations. 
And, and other churches have different teachings. And I said last week, you know, this isn't a series about other churches' teachings. And I said that I don't know everything. That doesn't mean I don't try to learn. You know, I, I take time to, to read, to study, to try to educate myself. Uh, what are these practices? Um, what is intended? Uh, you may have been familiar. It's a large word, transubstantiation. It's a big word that has to do with communion. And so I go to Catholic sources to try to read and understand and say what is happening. So I just have a post from Father William Saunders, Catholic Education Resource Center. Yes, the bread and wine do not change in characteristics. They still look the same, taste and smell the same, and hold the same shape. However, the reality, the what it is, the substance does not change. We do not receive bread and wine. We receive the body and blood of Christ. We call this change of substance transubstantiation, a term used by the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 and asserted again by our Holy Father in Ecclesia de Eucharistia number 15. Therefore, each time we celebrate Mass, we are plunged into the whole ever-present, everlasting mystery of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, and share intimately in life of our Lord through Holy Eucharist. Moreover, in and through the Holy Eucharist, our late Holy Father taught us that we contemplate the face of Christ because he is truly present. And I think I understand the intent there, the idea of Jesus being truly present. You know, the idea of wanting to be taken back in that time and my memory, and that, that's what I want to do. I feel like I can do that on Sunday. I can be taken back in my mind. I can close my eyes. I can visualize the face of Jesus. I can look up and see him hanging on the cross without Jesus physically being present in my hands to do that. I, I was trying to illustrate it. I've I think of my grandpa every Christmas. You know, I told you, it's my grandpa Hall cut out a wooden Santa Claus when I was one. Gave it to me for my first birthday. And it's been on our Christmas tree every year since. And every year I take that out of the box and I, I hold that in my hand. And I always think of my grandpa. He's not physically present, but certainly I never forget him. And, and when you have, if you're out in the street, so you say, and you have these conversations about blood and body and eating and drinking, and some people raise their eyebrows and you say, well, what do you teach? What do you understand? And, and part of that debate centers around John 6. What did Jesus mean and not mean at the end of John 6 when he said this in verse 53? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. So somebody might pull that out and say, well, Jesus said it. It's right there. Uh, it sounds like, but doesn't the Bible prohibit drinking blood elsewhere? It does, Leviticus 17, others. Surely the Bible's against cannibalism, it is. You know, what, what is the context? What is it? Jesus said this in the synagogue in John 6. What is happening in John 6? This is important. What is the setting of John 6? Because the people have a hard time with this when he said it. Verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? You hear that term a lot today. What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? And he says in verse 63, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit. They are life. Jesus said the words. He uses those as a, an illustration, a figure. And then he says here, you, you don't have to physically take in my flesh. And so he says, so why did he say it earlier? That's just confusing. What's the context? I've been saying John 6, John 6. What's the whole of John 6? Where does John 6 start? If you go back to the first verse of John chapter 6, you're going to find Jesus feeding 5,000 men and then their families. You may be familiar with that account. They're, what does he do? He gives them bread. He feeds them a meal. And then after the feeding, they want to make him king. He doesn't want any part of that. He walks away, goes up on a mountain by himself, dismisses the crowd. And then that's the night when he, the disciples are in the boat and he walks out on the water. And in the morning, he and the disciples are now in Capernaum, Capernaum. People are like, where'd he go? And they literally come around the lake to find him. And what does he say? What do you want? You want another meal, don't you? You're, you're, you're looking for me because you had your fill. And he starts in teaching. He says, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm the bread of life. 
That's what you're seeking. And he tries to give this explanation you know, to understand what's really, you want food? I'll give you food. Does this offend you? The context matters. And I had more research, and that's, uh, we put that definition up there for concomitance, and, and that's the struggle that I have. When, I know you can't read that fine print because it has, and I struggled with the words. And I actually ended up counting size of words. And, and there were 22 of that definition's 141 words that were three syllables or more. That's 16% of them were, were big words. I had to look up. And I thought... I want to contrast that with something Jesus taught. So I just flipped to the Sermon on the Mount, and I counted the words in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and I counted how many were three syllables or more. And it was only 4%. 96% of the time, Jesus is going to use a one- or two-syllable word. Basic, simple, easy to understand. And that's not to say that sometimes we don't use bigger words. I, I, there's times when I have long words, and I use big words, and I understand definitions. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, how, how do you guys explain this out there in the street? You know, I, I know what happens here. You give me as much time as I want to take, 30 minutes. You let me practice, put it on a screen, prepare it, do the best I can. You go to school, you're between classes, you might have three minutes. You, know, you might be in the airport with somebody, and their flight leaves in six minutes, you know, passing somebody at work. What, what I want is to say, how can we all understand? How can we find words that we understand? How can we explain what's going on? I don't want to be in the position where you're always constantly saying, well, go ask my minister. He'll explain it to you. you know, we want to understand these. Yes, I understand. Jesus said, take this and eat it. And he said, this, this is my body. And he said that while he's holding a piece of bread a symbol, and all of the disciples understood exactly what he meant. This bread will represent my body. It is the exact same thing that God told Moses about the lamb, the Passover meal. This is Exodus 12, 11. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It is really a lamb. It's really a meal. But it is a symbol of what's at, literally the Lord's Passover is happening over your head, as the angel of death passes over your house while you're eating this meal. This lamb is a symbolic reminder. Just if you were, if you were to take somebody to Washington, D.C., they don't know a whole lot about our country and our history, and you take them into the Lincoln Memorial, and you see that statue, and you point to it, and you say, that's Lincoln. And they're going to say, wow, he was really tall. You know, it's like, no, that's just a symbol. You know, and I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not trying to be argumentative. I'm trying to understand. <clears throat> I'm trying to underply. I'm trying to understand what worthy means. Um, there's a phrase in here that says, in a worthy manner. Verse 27, 28, 29, that paragraph. Probably a lot of Christians, that's, that's the one that's like, oh, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be unworthy. Valid concern. Um, Reader's Digest had a little seven-year-old, Michael. and he didn't, They didn't go to church all the time, but he went with his parents. And they tried to explain what was going to happen. They didn't, they didn't think of everything, and they had communion. He wasn't ready for it. And so afterwards, they said, well, what did you think of, of that portion? He said, well, I, said, I didn't think much of the cookies, and there wasn't enough juice. <laughs> he just he had a little different understanding. Uh, another little kid is kneeling next to his mom, and, and she comes, and she takes the communion. She comes back and kneels down to pray, and, and he taps her on the floor and says, well, how does that little pill taste? And she doesn't say anything because she's praying. And he said, so it's one that puts you to sleep. You know, just different people. Like, I, well, I want to make sure that I'm worthy. It is serious. These are the words from Paul. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's part of what we are concerned. Worthy. I will caution you, worthy in an unworthy modifies what? Manner, not whoever. The concern is the manner. Uh, communion is not just available to only worthy people. None, none of us are worthy by those standards. We all depend on grace. You, know, you talk about taking communion, worthy manner, this portion of our service is not a weekly sin eraser. 
No, that's not his intent. You, you don't come to church and say, okay, what bad things did I do last week? I'm going to confess them, take communion, receive forgiveness. That's not the intent. Hey, this is Dr. Andrew Parris, what the Bible says about the Lord's Supper. Scripture nowhere connects forgiveness with the supper. He said, if, if you're going to connect that, then you want to, you'd better die on Sunday morning, right, after you just got... That's not how it works. That's not the process. You know? It says, there is confession time. I don't take communion to receive forgiveness. I take it to remember I've already been forgiven by Jesus and his death. on the, There's a big difference between those two. Believers don't have to worry about being an unworthy person. His sacrifice, his grace, makes all of us worthy. What I want to be mindful of is my attitude. And the way I partake and how I interact with other people. What, why is Paul warning these Corinthian people? You guys are making a mockery of this. You're taking it lightly. It's a big joke to you. Other people might want to be serious. They're trying to concentrate. We make an effort during communion, you know, we, for the whole service, but especially then, to, to make it as easy as possible to focus. You know, might have soft music, usually playing something, try to drown out the cost and things. We're usually trying to challenge it. like, can you, can you make it another 30 seconds? You know, you know in a normal service, we're going to let you stand up. As soon as communion's over, we're going to sing a song. We do it every week. We're going to stand up, come and go as you please right there. That's a good time, you know. But during the time, we try to do everything we can to, to give everybody the opportunity to focus, and that's what, I'm, that's what I need to ask myself. How am I affecting people around me? You know, how did I affect them this past week? Dr. Paris had, these are good self-examination questions. I want to examine myself. Who am I? I'm going to take the Lord's Supper. Who am I? What, what have I done this week for the Lord? How have I done this past week? My thoughts? My passions? Purity? What did my tongue sound like this week? What words did I use? How did I spend my time? My food? Worshiping in private? What, what, what progress have I made in my faith this week, what do I want? I'm going to examine myself, what do I want? What do I need from God? I need grace. We all need grace. Where's the, my weakest point when I need it the most? What comfort do I want? What, what, what concern do I want to express for someone else? What complaint do I have for God? Examining myself. What am I going to resolve to do this week? To pray, to study, share my faith. Worthy questions. To, to help me partake in a worthy manner. <clears throat> and then I put the unity at the end, um, the unity of communion. I, I don't know about you, it's, I default sometimes to songs, and, and the song that comes in my head here is from High School Musical. You know, we're all in this together. It's, it's, and, and they're all in the gym, and if you, if you remember the musical, and all these kids are in the gym, and everybody's in the gym. The, the cheerleaders, the uh, actors, the academics, the musicians, the athletes, they're all in there together, and that's what they're singing. And verse 2 says, we're all here and speaking out with one voice. That's exactly what Jesus has in mind. He's in the upper room, and he's gathered with his disciples, and, he, and that's exactly what we're going to be sharing. We're all together. You know? Paul's words, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're, we're all in this together. And we've had this comment before. If you look around this room... Some of these, be honest, some of these people, if it weren't for the church, what, how many connections would you have with some of the people? Some of us it would not be, but that we have grown here together, and we have become family together. And every week, we pause, and we reflect, and we partake, and we remember, and we're on it together. And in this, I don't know about you, but this current cultural climate, I relish having a minute or five where I can sit down with 100 people who actually believe the same thing I do and feel the same way I do about something. We're all in this together. That's, it, was, it was actually one of the most enjoyable portions of taking the Lord's Supper when we were in Australia was counting back to figure out what you guys were doing while we were doing that. Because you know, we were 16 hours ahead. And we're having communion going, okay, it's, uh, this week it's Saturday at 6, so some of them are in the gym playing basketball, and some of them are probably giving kids baths. And, 
know, some are probably out in the barn, you know, but it, and we were separated by I don't know how many thousands of miles, but we're still in this together, all of us, our global family. Some of us will remember what it tasted like in, in sitting next to a Haitian kid in church there. Some will remember being in Arizona, Spain. Oh, uh, I think of some of the churches we visited and took communion with the boys when we were on vacation. I showed you a picture of my home church. I think of my, my youth group friends. We're now all old, but we still think of each other, you know, and I, I know what a lot of them are doing right now this morning. We're, we're all in this together. It's a weekly meal. Symbolic though it may be, it's a time for us to come together, remember together, proclaim together. We believe. We believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We believe it this week, just like we did last week. We're grateful for his death. We remember his burial and certainly his resurrection. We eagerly await his return. And until that time, we're going to keep meeting around this table to remember. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this time. Uh, we thank you for this place where we can come and serve and share and worship together. Uh, we thank you for these aspects of our worship and our service. Uh, we thank you for these times even still before us to gather around the table, to remember, uh, to share in a time of offering and prayer. And we just pray that you would continue to work in and through and on each of us uh, this week and beyond. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So with this invitation being now, you do have one of the more unique opportunities, the invitation to somebody who can come and be immersed this morning and then go ahead and take communion. Very nice thing if you're a church family. So if you know that you need to make that decision this morning, uh, we invite you. Let's all stand. This is the portion now where we have our invitation. I surrender all that stand.
to our communion time and reset that one. Now we will come to the point of the service where we gather around the table together and able to partake of the Lord's Supper. So let's prepare by singing, I believe, and he'll come now. Come.
things out of whack. Well, what's he doing now? Let's go through these prayer requests. Only 10 till 10. We have plenty of time. Set the clock back yet. Uh, there are about 9 or 10 here. I'm looking at them for the first time. Jeff Dunlap, if you would remember Jeanette's son losing his job March 21st, the company is moving. So I want to pray for Jeff that he can find a good new job. And also for Joellen, Jeanette, Hunter, and Archer and the family. Does the vertigo balance some hearing, some miswork all last week? So you want to remember Joellen and the physical battle there for her. It says, pray for Jeff and Deb Barrett. It says, Jeff got bitten by a large dog their first night on vacation. Remember that? Keep them in prayer for their travels. We do have a praise for Bryce Lee, Denny and Charlotte's son. Uh, he had an accident Sunday night, uh, totaled his truck and another car, but uh, both he and the other individual walked away with only bruises, so we're grateful for that degree. Uh, remember Barb Woodall, Karen Kaiser's sister, says here neurological problems, so you want to lift up Barb in that. Remember Rachel Anglin and her baby, um, stress test uh, two times a week until the baby is born, so you remember uh, the Anglins and Rachel. Kathy Anglin will have her first infusion this week on the 13th. Kathy Imch has a shoulder replacement tomorrow at 11.30. And another one says the same thing, I'm not skipping one. It just says Kathy will have a shoulder replacement tomorrow. So. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> do appreciate that you be aware of those. If you're in the memorization challenge, we'll head downstairs right here after we have our response and we're going to give you the throw. I know it's hard. I appreciate the work of all the teams. There are two teams that are exactly top after two weeks. It's a dead heat. So, keep all those folks in prayer. And for those who are in the challenge, I don't remember the fourth and fifth for our next week. I think when I'm Psalm 100, and I can't remember the fifth one, but whatever your fourth and fifth texts are, you are challenged to work on, what's the other one, Craig? Philippians 4 and then James 1. Philippians 4 and then James 1. Okay. Philippians 4 and James 1. Psalm 100 is 4 and then Philippians and then James. Okay. Psalm 100 is number 4 and then Philippians. So what's going to happen is you've got to look at Psalm 100 and Philippians 4. And next week I'm going to ask a random person in the congregation to pick my left hand or my right hand. I'll have them both ready. And whatever that person picks, that's the one you're going to have to do. So I know it's hard, but I appreciate your effort to work on the scripture. <clears throat> Bear that in mind for today. Um, anything else? Stephen, Daniel, anything you guys back there? Uh, Daniel will teach tonight. And um, if you're going on the Arizona trip, I just need a couple uh, pieces of information from you to take back to Brian to uh, get everybody like registered as a whole. So. Daniel, are you willing to pray for us? Let's all stand and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll sing our response. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just wanted to uh, come to you today to say thank you. Lord, you bless us in so many different ways and it's, it's so amazing to see how you work in our lives. God, uh, as, we, as we go through this week, I ask that you be with this congregation. Help us show you to others. Help us show you to our families to our friends, to our kids, to everyone. God, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Right, let's close with, O Lord, your beautiful.